Disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of USA Global TV and Radio. The content presented is for informational purposes only and is intended to foster open discussion and debate. Viewer discretion is advised. USA Global TV and Radio does not endorse any particular viewpoint and encourages viewers to seek out additional information and perspectives. Saving America with Dr. David D. Schein. Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. The Communist Party of China continues its persecution of the spiritual group Falun Gong. Evan Gershkowitz's conviction for espionage in Russia after a crash that killed 16 NTSB said people underestimate marijuana's impact on drivers. This is Dr. David D. Shine for the special episode of Saving America with our weekly update. <laughs> Here are some of the top stories that we've been following. The Communist Party of China, also known as the CCP, continues its persecution of the spiritual group Falun Gong. This is one of the most compelling and disturbing situations across civilization in the whole world today. Communists like Z don't like religions or quasi-religions competing with their communist manifesto. That includes a pretty harmless sect called Falun Gong, which started around 1992. They follow three truths, compassion, forbearance, and do five meditative exercises of their practice each day. By now, 70 to 100 million Chinese have begun to follow this pretty simple concept. It sounds a lot like Buddhism and Hinduism, which of course are very popular within various Asian cultures around the world. So in 1999, the geniuses at the CCP decided to eradicate Falun Gong. Now remember, this is 70 to 100 million people. They've been using illegal arrest, brainwashing, and torture, and perhaps the most horrible thing yet, harvesting organs from live prisoners. Yes. Our ineffective U.S. Department of State says it's opposing these inhuman practices. To date, the only thing I've seen them do is to block importation of Chinese human organs since they may be the result of this practice. To me, it stinks of the Holocaust all over again. They claim, this is the State Department, to talk with the CCP. This is a silly statement and I don't know why we're still talking to them. The civilized world needs to seal off the CCP until they change their approach to both their own citizens and the rest of the world. They're becoming a very dangerous force in the world. And that's one of our central themes here for saving America, because it also helps to save the world if we can rein in the craziness that's going on over there. In the United States, there is a group called Friends of Falun Gong. It's a nonprofit that was founded in the year 2000. I encourage you to check them out. I've extended invitation for a representative to be interviewed for Saving America. Speaking of failures of our Department of State, what do you need to know about Evan Gershkowitz's conviction for espionage in Russia? The Wall Street Journal reporter uh, Evan Gershkowitz was sentenced to 16 years in prison on a totally bogus spying charge 
that follows the usual Russian kangaroo court proceedings. The WSJ and the American government have consistently maintained that this gentleman is not a spy in any way. By the way, he does speak Russian. He was born in the USA, but both of his parents fled from the USSR at an earlier point. So he may have been targeted for that reason, since as I think everybody knows by now, Putin is trying to reconstruct the USSR, despite the fact that it failed in classic fashion. White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby said Wednesday, Russia has failed to justify Evans' continued detention. He, like fellow American Paul Whelan, is simply being used as a bargaining chip. Big excitement, John Kirby. What are you doing about it? The State Department's been using some strange metrics to decide who to swap. Brittany Griner was serving nine and a half years sentence for cannabis possession. She appears to have been a DEI pick since there was no sense to her being exchanged for a much higher value asset. Arms dealer Victor Bout, who was imprisoned in the U.S., the Russians got the better end of that deal. Griner has openly expressed her dislike of the USA. Gee, thanks, Brittany. Marine vet and Trevor Reed, who was serving nine years in Russia for assaulting a police officer, has been swapped for Russian pilot Konstantin Yaroshenko, and he was serving a 20-year sentence for cocaine trafficking. I'm recommending that the failed Biden state and the authorities begin arresting everyone from Russia who they've got running around here, whether they're mock diplomats or so-called journalists who are probably over here spying on us, and make sure that we have quite a stable of folks to swap. This is easy, folks. It's not hard. And our State Department needs to measure up to the international standard, which unfortunately means dealing with Z in China and Putin in Russia. Another Biden failure as Secret Service Director has resigned. And uh, she resigned when she finally got under bipartisan pressure, which is very interesting. But I think that we have enough Democrats in in the House and the Senate who can read and write. That's not a given, folks. Uh, but what's happening is, is that they are realizing that some of their lives may be jeopardized now or in the future if we don't have a better Secret Service. So I think that's a, a positive. After a crash that killed 16 NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, their chief said people underestimate marijuana's impact on drivers. This is an American tragedy where six high school girls in a small car in Oklahoma crashed into a big semi-trailer truck after reportedly running a stop sign in 2022. The NTSB researched the accident and said the teen driving may have been impacted by marijuana and distracted by the other youngsters in the car. And in fact, I seem to recall that in many states, a teen driver must be in the car either with an adult or simply cannot be in the car with another teenager. Sounds like this either was not enforced in Oklahoma or it was not the policy in Oklahoma at the time. Uh, the NTSB also observed as more states have legalized recreational marijuana, teens and adults tend to us and underestimate the risks of driving under its influence. My regular audience knows that I am a hardcore about driving under the influence of any substance that impacts a driver's judgment. I'm openly hostile to legalizing marijuana. It is a mind-altering drug. I grew up during the time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In fact, that's the uh, subject of my current book in process, A Cheap Education. And it sounds romantic sometimes, but broken lives and worse can result from mind-altering substances. I recall a friend of mine from college who did enough marijuana, marijuana, not heavier drugs, that he dropped out of college before he finished his junior year. I'm pleased to say that later he was able to get his act together and is enjoying life as a semi-retired person today. So good ending, but um, it was rather disturbing to get reports to me from his roommate in real time of finding uh, this uh, young man. Uh, laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling instead of doing his homework. Yes. Clinton appointed federal judge David Carter says this, California teachers were right to severely punish a girl seven for writing the words any life 
under a Black Lives Matter drawing. Why? Because the idiot judge says she's too young to have First Amendment rights. I again encourage all rational people to flee the state of California featuring high taxes and limited freedom. By the way, this judge charter is also the one who interfered with attorney-client privilege and ordered the transfer of four emails from Trump attorney John Eastman to the House January 6th committee. Um, in my humble opinion, I think Judge Carter should lose his bar card. It's time for us to crack down on people on the bench who do not follow the law. Biden's Defense Department labels pro-life organizations as terrorist organizations during an anti-terrorism briefing. The presentation specifically targets groups like National Right to Life and Operation Rescue, which have long been pillars of the pro-life community. These organizations are dedicated to peaceful advocacy against abortion grounded in the belief that every life is valuable and worth protection. As noted before, I favor a rational approach to abortion, and we must always support the life of the mothers when hard decisions have to be made. The vast majority of doctors do not want to perform abortions. So when they say the life of the mother is in jeopardy, the authorities need to accept that. Biden pulls out of the presidential race. My predictions. Power brokers, not Obama, made the decision. The slopstream media likes to paint Obama as a force, but he is just the other high-profile puppet, not the puppet master. Not sure why they keep promoting that false narrative. Biden's collapse was not due to age. I'm sick of hearing about his age. Trump is a few years younger and clearly is ready for the fight. Nancy Pelosi is three years older than Biden and still profiteering and expressing her warped opinions. Biden's cause is simply a failed administration and a rapid slide into dementia. COVID is a convenient whipping boy. But the deciders here really, the what did you do for me lately crew, that's the deep state folks. They're still in charge. And I hope America can make some changes in the near future to turn that around. It is likely at this point that the inept Kamala Harris will be at the top of the ticket. I am more concerned about her taking Biden's place before January 2025, Inauguration Day. I also predict that anyone who runs on the Dem ticket in 2024 will be sacrificed. They will disappear from history like other losing presidential candidates. Anybody remember Walter Mondale? The power elite are holding that whack job Newsom from California for the 2028 election. Watch for that, folks. It's going to be going to be fun. Lots of material for Dr. Shine around here, I can promise you that. The only Dem platform is murdering babies. Maybe now we can reach a nationwide compromise to limit very late-term abortions, but preserve the majority opinion that saving the life of a mother and allowing it in the cases of rape and incest should be allowed without further trauma to the woman and undue pressure on the doctors. There is the alleged involvement of a number of the Biden family members in what is reported to be a decade-long scam. I want the reported investigations to continue. If deemed appropriate, a federal trial could be brought for money laundering, RICO violations, representing foreign interests without registering, tax evasion, and collaborating in possible other criminal activity. Make no mistake, time to hold Joe Biden responsible. A guardian can be appointed for Biden, which is a standard procedure in legal matters. Dementia is not an excuse for justice. The taxpayers of America deserve nothing less. I stand by my recent prediction that Trump will carry at least 44 states as rational people who do not like him will hold their noses and vote for their wallets and their children. We could see a Democrat surge to RFK Jr., but I doubt that will be enough of a vote to make a difference. I call on Americans from all political perspectives to point in-person observers or observe them uh, themselves at as many polling stations across America as possible this fall. 
They can create video records of the misdeeds if observed. No more stolen election claims. Whatever happens, we need to be able to say that it was a fair and square election. This cannot continue to be a bipartisan issue. Time to end the trappings of a banana republic. We've got a special for you this time. I award a richly deserved A grade to a politician, celebrity, or other person who ends up in the public eye. 12-year-old Liam Morrison, whose common sense video has not gone viral, that shows him speaking about his experience at a school committee meeting in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Yes, the, the heart of the WAC liberals. Why was young Liam accosted by his teachers? He committed the horrific crime of wearing a t-shirt that said, there are only two genders. His idiot woke teachers claimed that this caused other students to feel unsafe. He rather matter-of-factly states that not a single student expressed this to him. So we must assume that the teachers thought this was somehow anti-LGBT. My loyal listeners, I was in the entertainment business many years ago. We had gay performers and others in business. I was a TV junkie when we had three major channels plus PBS. There were openly gay people on television. I'm not going to name the actors that, that were involved in that, but nobody made a big deal out of it. That's just the way life was. I, I think the majority of adults in America have been accepting of this for a very long time. Further, as a human resource consultant and employment attorney, I went through the HIV scare of the late 80s and early 90s. I had employers in good faith come to me and said, we are afraid to hire gay males because we are afraid of HIV. And I said, that is inappropriate. These are human beings. HIV does not spread through casual conduct You in contact. You should continue to hire them and to do proceed like normal. We got through the HIV crisis today. Apparently, we have some pretty good medications out there. Unfortunately, it's still an issue in parts of the community, but we got through that. And again, it is not about being gay, period. This message is simple. We're all members of the human race. As long as another human is not trying to hurt me or my family, I need to treat them with respect and dignity, regardless of their any other description, their gender, their or sexual orientation, and so forth. That's just the way life is. And I'm very proud of my personal record of working with people of all descriptions. But there's suddenly we've got this big deal. Let's get real, folks. There are only two genders. Not sure why the LGBT community decided to jump on this, but I can tell you that my personal friends are gay are very upset about this because it's the wrong fight and it doesn't help the gay community. Now, a lot of this reminds me of the famed story by Hans Christian Andersen the emperor's new clothes. Remember that story. Two con men come to town and claim to have magic cloth. Somehow they get before the king and persuade him that this magic cloth can only be seen by him and these special tailors. They collect a big payday and the king parades down the street in front of the throngs of his followers. And one little boy calls out, hey, the emperor has no clothes. Folks, that is the current situation we're dealing with. When a 12-year-old boy points out something that is an absolute biological fact, men are not women, men cannot have babies. And for some reason, the Lord blessed us in this fashion and that's the way it is. And it doesn't have anything to do with your sexual preference. It has to do with how we were made over the many, many eons that it took to get where we are today on this small planet called Earth. And so, folks, young Liam Neil Morrison was that little fellow calling out, the emperor has new clothes. 
and he's therefore awarded the coveted Saving America a grade. A federal judge denied the request to block Chicago's security plan for the Democratic National Convention. We'll call that just DNC. A federal judge rejected a motion by bodies outside of unjust laws an LGBTQ advocacy group to block Chicago's ordinance related to the creation of a security zone around the Democratic National Convention. The DNC will be held August 19th to the 22nd in Chicago. Due to the announcement by Joe Biden that he will no longer be a candidate, this could be one of the most raucous conventions in modern history. It's a fascinating bit of history repeating itself. The DNC was held in Chicago in the summer of 1968 during the height of the Vietnam War protests. TV news reports showed large crowds blocking the streets near the convention site. Police hit demonstrators blocking the streets with nightsticks and dragged them into waiting police vans. The chant by the protesters was, the whole world's watching, indicating the public was watching what the Chicago police were doing to the protesters and obviously objecting to what they regarded as a brutal treatment. So apparently, and with good reason, Chicago wants to avoid another black eye 56 years later. The subject lawsuit related to the group's request to protest next to the DNC. It also sought a preliminary injunction against the city ordinance that restricted a list of items, which would be things that could be brought inside the security perimeter. The list of prohibited items included laptops, sealed packages, drones, firearms, ammunition, tents, pointed objects, including knives of any kind, and any other items considered potential safety hazards. The protest group argued that the Chicago ordinance was unconstitutionally vague in violation of their 14th Amendment due process rights and that it will have a chilling effect on their First Amendment rights. However, the judge saw it differently, ruling that the ordinance has established clearly defined minimal guidelines to govern law enforcement as required by the Constitution. The judge continued, plaintiff's argument that a protester would be punished for carrying items such as pens, first aid kits, and protest buttons is well beyond the pale of any reasonable interpretation of the ordinance. Simply put, if plaintiffs show up at the protest with pens, first aid kits and protest buttons, they are unlikely to face punishment. And the judge actually went as far as saying, well, if there's a pair of scissors in the first aid kit, which there are not many first aid kits, maybe the scissors get taken out, but the first aid kit itself will still be approved. The ACLU, which represented the plaintiffs in this matter, has said it will attempt to appeal the judge's ruling. I vividly recall the assassination of JFK when I was a little kid. That tragic event and then 9-11 were the two most historic markers of my life. Close behind the moon landing and Reagan surviving an assassination attempt in 1981. And now, 43 years later, Trump surviving a close call. Killing famous people is often because a deranged person wants fame, no matter how they achieve it. The Reagan shooting, the John Lennon shooting, and now possibly the Trump shooting, indeed, may not be related to politics, but a search, a deranged search for fame. The Selena Quintanilla uh, shooting may fall into the same category. On the other hand, Lee Harvey Oswald, best we can tell, had been set up by the USSR. It was likely payback against JFK and the USA for the botched Bay of Pigs debacle in Cuba. Most pundits on both sides of the aisle have quickly attached a political motive to the Trump shooting. More on that in a minute. Part of this tragedy is the death of one man at the, at the event and two other men remain in critical condition. The dead man was a firefighter who was there with his wife and two daughters, Corey Compatore, who dove to cover his family and paid the ultimate price. Very little has been released as of this episode about the other two. On the positive side, Trump supporters have made donations to a GoFundMe established for those three families. If you can afford it, I encourage your support there. 
Turning back to politics, the situation is eerily parallel to Putin's Russia. He jailed his chief political rival, then released him, and as he boarded his first plane, that plane magically crashed. Putin claimed he was not responsible, but Xi, another military rival, also died in a plane crash in the last 18 months. Folks, you see the parallels with the current administration. Note this is also the anniversary of the 1933 takeover of all political action by Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany. The current charged environment was created by Hitler-esque Dems claiming that Trump is the Hitler. Think about this. If Trump was really the Hitler the Dems have been trying to claim, he would never have left the White House in January of 2021. The Dems, with their name-calling campaign and lawfare against Trump, look a lot more like Hitler. Now they're running for the hills and pulling their ludicrous ads because the gig is up. I would have thought that with Trump's campaign financing rolling along and Biden's crashing, they might have figured out before the big scare that just happened. In the last few weeks, the biggest cover-up since Wilson last year in the White House, that's 106 years ago, has now been exposed. This disgrace has been perpetrated by the Biden puppet masters and the slop stream media of the, on the American people. We responsible Americans cannot let them get away without payback. I call on Americans to be sure that every Dem candidate from city council to the presidency go down in defeat. No violence needed, folks. Let's make sure it happens at the ballot box. That will let this failed political party know that they cannot continue to defraud the American people, pretending to be part of democracy when they are actually part of the communist takeover of America. I'm a hardcore facts person and not into conspiracy theories. I do feel that the U.S. Secret Service failed to properly protect Trump at the rally. The shooter was in plain view on an elevated building outside the perimeter. We keep hearing outside the perimeter. Hey, if it was a high point that could be seen from inside the venue for this uh, uh, political rally, seems like it should have been covered. The shooter was in plain view. A sniper took him out in seconds. Why was he taken out after and not before the grievous harm that he did? Further, I'm not sure what dangerous clown in the Biden administration made the decision to deny RFK Jr. Secret Service protection. That family has had too much tragedy. Let's not let that happen again. Give him Secret Service protection today. I do not support him as a candidate, as he is a left winger, and his VP choice is simply a whack commie. But enough is enough. My projection is that regardless of the candidate and the hapless Dems run in November, Trump will win in a landslide. I am projecting a win in at least 44 states. Hopefully that will include the House and the Senate in, in future months. I will spell out critical priorities for the new administration. Time to get America back on track, and that does not include running up the national debt. And our series of interviews for Saving America establishes that the world is full of interesting people. And we welcome Mary Elizabeth Jackson, author, writer, educator, podcaster, and advocate for special needs children. She has so many things in her background that I had to cut it to the bone to save time for this interview. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Jackson is a five-time number one on Amazon best-selling author. In collaborative anthology, she has Women with Healing Gifts, Glimpses into the World of Autism, The Fearless Entrepreneurs, number four, an international bestseller, Invisible No More, Invincible Forevermore, August of 2021, and she has The Book I Read, March of 2022. Jackson is also the 2017 Gold Maxi Award winning author of the children's book, Perfectly Precious Pulicious. Jackson has recently released her inspired kid series with book one, Perfectly Me. She lives with her hubby, three kids, and a dog in Nashville. We welcome her for her first appearance on Saving America.
Oh my gosh. Thank you, David. It's so, it's just so nice to be here. I'm so excited about it. And I'm so glad we got to meet because I think you're really fascinating too. And you know, everybody has a story, don't they? <laughs> it's amazing. And you've got multiple stories. <laughs> And as you know, what we do on Saving America is we ask three questions. So the first one is, tell us about being a certified special needs advocate and an ambassador advocate for Autism Tennessee. I, it says Autism TN, and I'm assuming that's Autism Tennessee. Yes, it is. Actually, it's a, it's a nonprofit that's here in Nashville, and it is the only nonprofit that's specifically geared toward autism, uh, families raising individuals with autism or who have, you know, somebody in the family that has autism. And um, I would say it's a very exciting time right now because I'm working on some very exciting projects. And um, some that some were kind of like, oh, I hope that happens. And now it is, you know, and um, I've been parenting for over 24 years. I have three children, two of my children are on the spectrum. So that is how I became an advocate and first started out as an advocate parent. And along my journey, um, my middle daughter, when she was five, experienced uh, an incredible trauma in school and it kind of changed my direction as an advocate. And I started to, uh, I, I chose to go the path of trying to change law in the state that I live in. And that took me down a very different road. And then um, when my third son came, my third child, my son, uh, late in life, and he was born with his own set of challenges, that's how I became an author. And, um, you know, it's been very uh, interesting, I think, to, and, and something I really wanted to do was to be able to intertwine everything. So for being an ambassador advocate with uh, Autism Tennessee, I go out into the public and do events and education. And right now we are launching our Building Bridges program. I have uh, people I'm training tomorrow. So we go into schools, daycares, preschools, uh, corporations and train individuals on early signs and symptoms of autism and what to do, how to help. And because it's one in 36 kids now that's being diagnosed with autism, you know, the rate is going up and up. Um, more and more people are being diagnosed. We need this education and awareness out there. So I'm really excited to be a part of this uh, program. And we really can teach it across the country if anyone's interested, because we are going to be taking it to video as well. I'll be a part of launching that. And then also um, working with some grants to be able to um, put some sensory rooms and make air, uh, businesses and libraries and museums and all kinds of places have uh, be more sensory friendly. And so uh, we're working on a project with the Nashville airport right now. So I'm very excited about this. This is, this is good stuff. Well, especially with, we're hearing so much about it today. Um, uh, just to, to, to tie it to me, believe it or not, in the last hour, I have spoken with a graduate student at my university who is on the spectrum uh, he has uh, worked with me over a, a fairly long period of time because I was advisor when he got his uh, first graduate degree, and he's back getting another graduate degree, and we had a registration issue, so I was working with him on that. So I'm, I'm used to adjusting to it in the classroom, uh, even at a graduate level. Uh, and uh, it's it's interesting. I have one of my grandchildren who has uh, been diagnosed as on the spectrum, although it's, it seems to be fairly uh, modest. So this is something that seems to be impacting, uh, you know, first of all, as teachers were impacted, but also certainly as parents and grandparents. So it's something that's, uh, you know, part of the reality of life. And I'm glad people are adjusting to it and taking uh, taking action to make it uh, more accommodating for people that are experiencing these uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a question too, with our limited time here, with five number one books on Amazon, let's explore your approach and some advice for members of our audience who want to write a successful book themselves. Mm. Well, that's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. So I would say you need to be prepared if you really want to be an author, be prepared for a lot of work. And, um, you know, unless you're already famous or have a lot of money to pour into it, you are going to do a lot of work and it'll take time. So you need to look at a long haul, like, okay, I want to go in and I'm going to do this for five years. You know, it takes about five 
plus years, maybe almost closer to 10 to become a very successful author. I was first published in 2017 and it took a while. Um, even if you get a publishing contract with a very large publishing company, they these days are, are going to expect you to do a lot of marketing and PR work yourself. So um, it's not about publishing and I'm gonna sit and wait for the checks to come in. You know, mm -hmm. I would say, if you wanna write, you need to write and don't wait for that, like cabin in the woods or, you know, cottage on the beach, you know, I, I've learned to write in car rider lines and practices and rehearsals and games. And, you know, when I have 20 minutes here and there, I've learned how to write that at those times. Um, but it's a passion of mine. So I, I think writing is a passion for a passion project. And, you know, if you are stuck or want to write not in a, and you don't know what to do, then talk to somebody who's already published, you know, do some research, look for someone that you could talk to a coach or something that would help you. Um, and you got to believe in what you're writing because you're writing, your book is going to be an extension of you. It's like your business card. And so, you know, you, you, you got to cheer it on, you know, and say, and, and I know for some of us, it's really hard to talk about ourselves, but for me, it was like, I took myself out of that because that was difficult, but talking about my book was so much easier, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to take every opportunity you can to promote. I mean, and kind of shamelessly, right, David? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I understand that I'm just a little bit behind you. My first book came out 2018 and the second one 2022 and sadly my current book which is not in the same series it's a very different book than the first two um, I'm very delayed uh, I've written the first uh, 12 14 chapters of about a 70 chapter book and of course even that is interesting to me as somebody who's read hundreds and hundreds of books over my career is that we're used to having a book with 12 or 15 chapters and now books have many more chapters and they're just they're just shorter have 1500 words a chapter and i'm kind of used to 3000 word chapters so it's just a very interesting how even the publishing business uh on my second book we've sold more uh kindles than we have uh, hard copies and growing up i would never have anticipated gee if i'm an author most of my work is electronic. It's interesting, isn't it? The whole platform, I mean, you were published in 2018. I was published in 2017. And the entire landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic changed everything for us, for creatives, period, and all kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. And so now we are having to learn how to do things differently in order to survive what's going on. And so, you know, electronic sales aren't bad, right? I mean, however we get a book in somebody's hand, you know? Absolutely. And get a chance to talk about it. And right. our third question today is, uh, can you share with our audience what they can expect when they listen to Writer's Corner Live and Cover to Cover, two of your, mm -hmm. your active series uh, online? Well, okay. So Writer's Corner Live was launched in 2017, 2018. So it's been six years and uh, we interview authors from all over the globe, um, anywhere from New York Times to indie, indie sensations. And uh, we're every Tuesday at 1030. Or, uh, well, right now it's 1130 because the time changed. So 1130 um, Eastern um, Central Time, sorry. And um, we are online. With that, it is live. So we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, that kind of thing. And then Cover to Cover is um, a separate show that I have myself because the other one I do with a friend of mine, she lives actually in um, Cape Town, South Africa. So isn't that cool? <laughs> we're yes. on totally different continents and we've never met, but we've been working together for six years and just really love doing it together. We have a great time. And um, Cover to Cover was born out of uh, my daughters are music artists and I am their manager, momager, we'll call it. That's what my girls call me. And so I was, uh, I was, I had contacted a PR company about, they were doing uh, magazine reviews for, they do them for music artists and authors. And so they were working on some reviews for me. And um, the owner said, you know, I was looking over your, your website and I want a book podcast 
for my PR company? And would you do it? I was like, hmm. So it took me about six months to decide because I was like, you know, how am I going to do this different? What do I do? But anyways, now I'm on Brushwood Media Network. I have over 340,000 listeners globally. I'm so excited about that. And uh, those when you tune in Saturdays and Sundays, 12 to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I focus on the backstories a lot of times of the authors. Being an author myself, I like to dive into what is behind the story, what is the li- what is the life journey of the person who's written these books. And, you know, they're New York Times bestsellers, they're today bestsellers, they're, de- they're debut authors. Sometimes they're just inspirational stories. And sometimes I focus more on things like um, people who write for the disability world and, mm-hmm. um, you know, anything that is uh, resources, tools, and helpful to those of us out there in the world who are looking for answers. And so I have, so it's kind of cover to cover, you know, it it can cover all kinds of things, but um, I'm really enjoying it. And I have just met some of the most amazing people, like the former CEO of Procter and Gamble and, you know, uh, somebody that, uh, well, I told you who I interviewed yesterday, like he's the <laughs> leading specialist in the world <laughs> for, uh, you know, crop circles. I mean, whoever thought I'd meet this gentleman, you know, and he's a famous artist of Freddie Silva and wonderful gentleman. I mean, he's just made it. It's just amazing all the people that we get to meet and interview and it makes it a real honor, you know, and a blessing. It, it sounds like a lot of fun. And of course, we got interviewed uh, uh, together uh, yes. uh, some months ago, which is how we got introduced in the first place. Right. And it's been a right. pleasure to get uh, connected with you. And it, it, it is an interesting journey. And as I said, there are so many interesting people in the world. And I think one of the things that we do is to help people in their cars or looking for something or maybe even sitting at the beach and to say, gosh, I didn't know anything about crop circles. And (laughs) now I know everything that I I ever needed to know about them. (laughs) And uh, I actually know what crop circles are, which I find fascinating. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm one of those crazy people who likes the the Karnak stones in France and Stonehenge. Oh, yes. And he is. (laughs) <laughs> yes. And he's done like 16 documentaries on all of that. And he's had all these meetings like with NASA. And so all this science in the past and our history are coming together. And it, it was so fascinating yesterday. And and I it's a real blessing to be able to share that with others. Um, because like you said, you know, we never know out there who might just need to hear something that someone says, and it may change everything for them. And it may just make them smile and may make them feel like, okay, I, I can get through today. Today I can be okay. I think that's a very, uh, a valuable, uh, concept and, uh, and one that we can certainly subscribe to, uh, Mary Elizabeth Jackson, it is so much fun to talk with you again and to uh, share you with our audience. Uh, Can you tell our audience about how they can get more information on you? Absolutely. And and Dr. David, thank you for having me. And yes, it's been such a pleasure getting to meet you and getting to interview you as well. And uh, so you can find me at www.maryejackson.com. And I am on social media, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and and TikTok. I go over there and do a lot of author little minute snippets about Mm -hmm. the behind the scenes. But my name, Mary Elizabeth Jackson, is pretty much where you can find me social media wise. And all my books, you can find my books on my website. You can find my shows. I have an inspired kid series that was, you know, inspired by my son who came in with challenges. And my goal as a writer, I have a middle grade reader coming out, but my goal as a writer is to empower kids um, and to help them to know however they came into this world, they are okay. So absolutely. Great. And as a grandparent, I could tell you that we're out getting um, getting books for the seven grandchildren and making sure that they feel connected to the world. So uh, you're doing something very valuable. Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. 
Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in.